Shalom, Havarim. Welcome, friends in Hebrew. My name is Tony Pino, and today we are going to be doing a teaching concerning Revelation 17 and 18. And I know that I have done some teachings on this chapter in the past, and I want to focus in on this particular teaching concerning what is often called the eschatological Yerushalayim. In other words, there is a growing popular view that when you read Revelation 17 through 18, this is speaking of Yerushalayim, the Yerushalayim that will be in the tribulation period, okay? They'll look at today's Yerushalayim, modern day Yerushalayim and say, look, they're not following the ways of Yahweh. Eventually they're going to accept the anti-Mashiach. He's gonna be welcomed into their city. Their city is going to grow into the great prostitute. All right, it's going to be the place of his headquarters. Uh, these people also hold that the anti-Mashiach, uh, at least the ones that I have talked to, let me put it that way, I uh, believe that he will be a Jew, that the anti-Mashiach will be a Jew, and that the city of Jerusalem will be the great harlot, the great prostitute. And so I want to go ahead and address this. I know I've addressed it once before, <clears throat> but I think I can be much clearer on this teaching, and I want to go over more scripture, and uh, we're going to break this up into two parts. We're mainly going to be doing chapter 16 uh, of Revelation, verses 12, all the way to the end of 17 in this teaching, and then we'll do chapter 18 in the second part, okay? And uh, of course, I do not hold to the position that the great prostitute is Jerusalem. I think there's clear evidence to refute that claim, even though those that hold that it is will show you passages, all right, that make it seem like it is. They cannot bring all of scripture together, I do not believe. And everything that I've saw and studied under those that hold to it, all right, they cannot bring all of scripture together. And that's the thing about a lot of teachings is a lot of teachings will bring you some scripture for their idea, and it'll make it look like it's, you know, the right view and everything because of the passages they look, but they're not showing you all of scripture. And there'll be scripture that will contradict their view. And I don't think that this group will be able to refute the idea that, Revelation 17 and 18 show no, like a purifying of the city. Like it's, it's being purified. Okay. It's being, it's going to be restored eventually. Okay. Versus uh, chapter 17 and 18 of the great prostitute is utter destruction. Never, never to be raised again. No one will ever inhabit it again. And that's not what you read about Yerushalayim. Yeshua will return and restore. You often hear how the people of Jerusalem are going to be purified and made whole and restored, okay, uh, because it is going to be the capital of the kingdom in the millennial reign time. Yeshua will rule and reign from Jerusalem. There's no way of getting around that, and you're not going to see that anywhere in Revelations chapters 17 and 18. So uh, that's something that they can just not get around, but we're going to go ahead and walk through this Okay, you're going to see a lot of similarities, and in many cases, it may seem like, you know, that Revelation 17 and 18, the great prostitute is Jerusalem, but it will not hold up to all of Scripture. Okay, uh, beautiful day today. We're heading into Shabbat. This is a beautiful time to do this teaching. We're heading into Yom Teruah here. This Monday night coming up is uh, a Moedim. It is an appointed time. It is a time of blowing, a time of trumpeting a time of awakening, amen, the focus, the central focus in it, on it is repenting, turning back to Yahweh, being awoke out of your slumber, we want to uh, have our focus, we do believe that Yeshua will return during this season sometime in the future, amen, during this time, uh, and we want to be ready, amen, and we should be walking in repentance all the time, but this is a special time for us to focus in, and let's return back to Yeshua. Let's return back to Yahweh and his ways, his covenants. Amen. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for those in Jerusalem to turn and receive Yeshua. We know that they're not following in the ways of Yeshua right now, that they're not following in their covenant relationship with Yahweh right now. Amen. And so they will need to be disciplined. They will need to be purified and purged of uh, the iniquity that is going on. Amen. And Yeshua will do that. Okay, but that's not what you're going to see in Revelation 17 and 18. So it's not going to stand up to proper scrutiny to say that that is the city of Jerusalem in the future during the tribulation period. Okay, and again, 
Um, I don't know if I've told you this or not, but within this uh, system of believing that the great harlot is Yerushalayim, they also hold that the anti-Mashiach, at least the ones I've talked to again, they've hold, they hold that he is going to be a Jew, that the anti-Mashiach will be Jewish, that he will be their long-awaited Messiah. They will welcome in. They'll create this, you know, uh, you know, this massive, wonderful place in Yerushalayim where the anti-Mashiach will be welcomed. I don't see that. I don't see that in scripture at all. When we look at the foreshadow of the anti-Mashiach to come, one of the best places to look at is the time of Hanukkah, the Maccabean revolt. All right. And you see that in Daniel chapter 11, towards the end of the chapter there, you can start right around 29 or so and read to the end. Uh, and, you know, Antiochus IV was the man back then who was the foreshadow of the future anti-Mashiach to come. He is a Gentile. He didn't make Yerushalayim his headquarters, okay? It was not his headquarters. It was always in chaos there, civil war there. There was always disruption there. Uh, Antiochus IV had to kill many Jews and many Jews were slaughtered. He took away the Torah, the law. He took away the daily offering. He put up a statue of Zeus in there, but it was not his headquarters. It was not this glorious place like Revelation 17 and 18 says of the great harlot, all right? And so that being a foreshadow also tells me that the great harlot is going to be a future city. It's going to be a city in the future here. Now, I am one that believes that we're still pretty far off from Yeshua returning, okay? But if I'm wrong and Yeshua returns anytime soon, I would hold that Mecca would be one of the candidates, okay? I hold that this new city that the Saudis are building, Naom, right now, could be a candidate if it becomes as big and wondrous as they want it to be. That could be a candidate in the future. And also, I hold that possibly everything could come full circle where the Tower of Babel was. There could be a city built, all right, uh, in the future over there in the land of Iraq that could become that great city, all right? It probably won't be, of course, called Babylon, but it'll be in the land of Babylon. And so the great prostitute, Babylon the Great, would have come full circle and be in the land and have that title, even though the name of the city uh, would not be called that, okay? Would carry that title. That's a possibility, right? But this idea of it being eschatological Yerushalayim in the future, I don't think it's going to hold under good scrutiny, Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, jump into this now. There's a lot more I can say, but I'll be saying it as we do the teaching. We first want to go to Revelation 16, starting with verse 12. Amen. Here we are in Revelation 16, starting with verse 12. All right, so here we are. It's at the end of the three and a half years. Towards the end here, we're seeing the final two bowl judgments being poured out. And we're getting ready to see that final battle where Yeshua returns. And we're getting a destruction of the great city, uh, the great prostitute. And so we're going to dig in here and see, is it Yerushalayim? Let's find out. All right, it says that the sixth angel poured out his bowl over the great river Euphrates. And its water was dried up to prepare the way of the kings from the east. Then I saw coming from the dragon's mouth and from the beast's mouth, and from the false prophet's mouth, three unclean spirits like frogs, who go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them to battle on the great day of Elohe Zabaot. Behold, I am coming like a thief. How unfortunate is the one who stays, I'm sorry, how fortunate is the one who stays alert and keeps his clothes on, lest he walk around naked and they see his shamefulness. This is Yeshua returning. Okay. Then the spirits gathered the kings to the place called in Hebrew, Har Megiddo. Verse 17. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air. A loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, it is done. And there were flashes of lightning and rumbling and clashes of thunder and a great earthquake such as never happened since mankind has been on the earth. So mighty was the quake. Then the great city was split into three parts and the cities of the nations collapsed. 
Babylon the Great was remembered before God to force her to drink the cup of the wine of his furious wrath. Every island fled away and no mountains were found, were to be found. Enormous hail, about a hundred pounds each, falls from heaven on the people, and the people cursed God because of the plague of the hail. So extreme was that plague. All right, so a lot of people like to point out because it's called the great city that it must be Jerusalem. But we know this is what? Babylon the Great. Okay. Babylon the Great was remembered before God to force her to drink the cup of the wine of her furious wrath. All right. So this city is called Babylon the Great. And because it's called the great city, many people, again, like to directly call it Jerusalem, but that will not be the case. One of the reasons why they do that is because when we go here to Revelation 11, it does mention a great city, and we will see that it will reflect Jerusalem. But just because something is called the great city doesn't mean it's Jerusalem. Okay. We have to remember that, you know, you can go to Joshua, Yehoshua chapter 10, verse 2. And Gibeon is called a great city there. And you can go to the book of Jonah, Yonah, and you can see that Nineveh is called the great city. Okay, there are a lot of great cities throughout uh, the Tanakh. Okay, these are pagan cities. And uh, it's not just Jerusalem that is called the great city. Okay, so they they try and, you know, try and force this to fit here. But there is no indication that this is Jerusalem right here. All right, let's go to Revelation chapter 11 so you can see that. All right, so here we have Revelation 11. This is the time of the two witnesses, okay? Now, let's see here that it's been given over to Jerusalem that the nations would trample the holy city for 42 months, okay? Three and a half years, they're going to control the holy city. For three and a half years, they're going to control it. Does this mean it'll be their headquarters? No, this just means that they will trample it, okay? It'll be under their authority, all right? And what's going to be happening in this place? Well, the two witnesses are going to be witnessing for the last three and a half years here. They're going to have great authority. They're going to be creating much chaos in this city, okay? Call, calling for repentance, calling for people to repent, very much like the prophets of the Tanakh, right? Always calling Jerusalem to repent and come back. All right, so as we get down here to verse seven, it says, when they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the abyss will make war on them and overcome them and kill them. And their corpses will lie in the open street of the great city that figuratively is called Sodom and Egypt. Now, listen, if it wanted it to be, you know, known to you that this is Babylon, the great, the great prostitute, it would have just had to say it right here. But this is not the same city as Babylon, the great, the great prostitute. It tells you right here, it is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt. And Jerusalem has been called that, all right? This other group will show you passages where Sodom and Egypt have figuratively been called, you know, uh, I mean, Jerusalem has figuratively been called Sodom and Egypt in the Tanakh. Yep, that's no problem. We have no problem with that. We know it's Jerusalem because it says it's where the Lord was crucified. Okay, but it doesn't say any of this in chapter 17 and 18 about the great prostitute. Okay, it is a great city. It is the headquarters of the anti-Mashiach, but it is not Jerusalem. That's not what it says there. And so just because something is called the great city, again, there are other, other cities, Nineveh being one, Gibeon being another. All right. It's not unusual to call a pagan city a great city. And this will be happening to Jerusalem at the end times. There's massive chaos going on there. The two witnesses have just been killed right before Yeshua coming back. Okay. They've been creating chaos the whole time there for the last three and a half years when the anti-Mashiach is ruling and reigning in his kingdom. Okay. And he's fighting all kinds of other empires in that that are trying to infringe on him. And he's got the mark of the beast going uh, that re reflect his worship 
at this time, at this time, everyone is worshiping him. Okay. They're not worshiping the woman. The woman's going to represent a religious system. Okay. He's going to get rid of that religious system so that they only worship him. All right. Let's go ahead and go back to Revelation 16. Amen. So as we continue here, we're going to now go into Revelation 17. We see that, you know, with this earthquake and with this uh, uh, drinking of the cup of the wine of his furious wrath here, this earthquake, every island was going to flee away. No mountains are going to be found. Okay. Well, in Jerusalem, Mount Zion will still exist. Okay. It'll be still the capital of where Yeshua will rule and reign. It's where Yahweh has placed his name. So every island is fled away. No mountains will be found here. Enormous hail, all right, about 100 pounds each falls from heaven on the people. And the people curse God because of the plague of hail. So extreme was that plague. Does this sound like Jerusalem? No, not at all. Not at all. Will Jerusalem be purged of her sins? Yes. Will she be restored? Does she have to go through a purification process? Sure she does. Absolutely she does. Amen. And Yeshua will restore Jerusalem. It's not that Jerusalem will never be found again, but that's what we're going to see what's going to happen to the great prostitute. All right, let's go ahead and go into verse one here. Revelation 17. Then one of the seven angels holding the seven bowls came and spoke with me saying, come, I will show you the sentencing of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. All right, so this city, this great prostitute, this religious system, this headquarters sits on many waters. We're going to see that has to do with nations and tongues and peoples, but we'll see that here a little bit later. And then it says the earth's kings commit sexual morality with her and those who dwell on the earth got drunk with the wine of her immorality. All right. So they're drinking of this religious system. Okay. This religious worship that all dates back to Babylon, all dates back to the tower of Babel, in my opinion. So when we're looking at this religious system of this woman, all right. As far as if Yeshua were to return anytime soon, it, in my opinion, it has to be of the Muslim religion. The Muslim religion is still on the uprise. It's still growing globally. It's not declining anywhere, but it's increasing. And it's covered the Middle East right now. And so when you look at, you know, uh, the 10 horns and the beasts and everything, and you look at this little horn rising up, what do you think it's going to rise up from? It's going to rise up from the Muslim religion. Okay, it's not going to be a Jew. It's going to be of a Gentile ethnicity. Okay, just like I said, just look at Hanukkah, look at Antiochus IV. There's your foreshadow. All right, he is a Gentile and he did not make Jerusalem his headquarters. So, this particular religious system, what did Antiochus IV want to do? He wanted to get rid of Torah, he wanted everyone to worship him as a god, he wanted everyone to worship Zeus. Okay, they were offering, uh, you know, offerings to Zeus that was forced upon all the people. Okay, Babylonian worship was accepted in Antiochus the Fourth's kingdom. He wanted everyone to be the same. That's why he outlawed circumcision. He outlawed the Torah. Okay, and so uh, trying to cause everyone to drink of that religious immorality. That's what Antiochus the Fourth did. That's what's going to happen here. It's I believe it'll be the religious system of the muslim faith okay if yeshua were to return soon now if you know we're still a thousand years off from Re yeshua returning or 500 years or 300 years or whatever maybe the muslim faith will have declined and gone away i don't know but as of right now if he were to return soon that's what i would hold to and i do hold to all right verse three so he carried me away in the rook into a wilderness and i saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names and had seven heads and 10 horns. So this woman is connected to this Babylonian. This Babylonian worship is connected to the seven headed beast. The seven headed beast. Okay. Are seven kingdoms, seven kingdoms. We're going to see. Okay. Six have already existed. Six have already existed in my opinion. Okay. You've got Egypt, you've got Assyria, you've got Babylon, you've got the Medo-Persian. You've got Greece, you've got Rome. Those are the six that have already existed and they've already fallen. 
Okay. The seventh, I believe, uh, is the revived Ottoman Empire. The, the Ottoman Empire lasted 600 years. I'm not talking about that one. Okay. It ceased to exist in 1923, but once it's revived, it will have the deadly wound that is healed. It has been brought back to life. Okay. So it's seven empires. All those heads represent empires. So the head that has the deadly wound is not the anti-Mashiach. He's not going to die and be raised from the dead. The empire is going to be resurrected. Okay. And then within this empire is going to have 10 horns. So the woman, it says, was clothed in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. She was holding a golden cup and in her hand full of detestable things and the filth of her immorality. On her head was given a name, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and the detestable things of the earth. Okay, so this becomes, of course, the headquarters of the anti-Mashiach. It will not be Jerusalem. It'll be a future city. Okay, this mother of prostitutes shows you that it is the greatest place of pagan worship ever to exist. Well, where did that once exist before? in Babylon. So could a city arise with some other name? There's all kinds of different names over there. Could they build a city over there that becomes the central capital of the Muslim world where the anti-Mashiach will sit and have his headquarters and all of its religious worship flow out of there, flow from there? Sure it could. Okay. Now, uh, those who hold that the Yerushalayim is the woman here, they will begin to try and take you back into the Tanakh and show you all the passages about the temple that speak of the decorations of the temple, uh, all the different items they use for building the Mishkan and the temple. And they'll say, look, see, this is talking about Yerushalayim right here. No, they would talk about that about any city, any great city. They would talk about that, any wealthy city, rich city and that. So that for me is not convincing evidence. I see the similarities and on the surface, it looks well, it looks good, okay? And the Tanakh is mainly about Yerushalayim, talking about her, but what does it say always about in the Tanakh about Yerushalayim? She will be restored, she will be purged, okay? Uh, she is the eternal wife of Yahweh and Yeshua will rule and reign from there, from Jerusalem, from Yerushalayim. Okay, he will restore, he will rule and reign during the millennial reign time. She is being restored and purified and made be beautiful. Okay. So this woman here is seated on the beast. This beast, it's the entire beast system. Okay. Got to make that real clear. It's the entire beast system. All seven heads. Okay. When the anti-Mashiach rises, uh, again, what one of these things that is uh, being shown you here is the totality of the uh, area of the anti-Mashiach's kingdom. Okay, just study the seven kingdoms there that have existed in the past. Study Egypt. Study you know Babylon and and Persia, and you know Greece and Rome and all that. That's the circumference of the anti-Mashiach kingdom in the future. It's not going to be global. He's not going to control the whole globe. As you see in Daniel chapter 11, he can't even control what is modern day Jordan today. That's going to be a place where a lot of Yah's people run to. Some people call, believe it'll be in the area of Petra. All right. And so as we can see here in verse six, so that kind of helps lead me into verse six here. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the kettle sheen. Okay. This in Greek here just means the holy ones. A lot of times your Bible will say the saints, okay? But the holy ones, this represents Yah's people. This is the people of Israel. He's going to be slaughtering the people of Israel, bringing them under the rule. The only people he won't slaughter is if you, what? If you commit to him, if you abandon, uh, you know, your faith in Yahweh. There are a lot of Jews that will not abandon their faith in Yahweh. They will resist the anti-Mashiach, okay? They will resist him. And so, yes, he will be slaughtering those that resist him and also those who are witnesses of Yeshua, okay? It's going to be both. 
you will become drunk. So this, this woman, this headquarters over there will be responsible. It will be where the authority comes from of slaughtering uh, the, you know, the people of Yah. Let's just go ahead and go to Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. Amen. So in Daniel chapter 11, starting with verse 36, we could go a little bit higher, but this really gets us to where we need to be. It says, so the king will do as he pleases, exalting and magnifying himself above every God. That's not something that Antiochus IV did. He never did that. But that is what, what the future anti-Mashiach will do, exalt himself against every other God. He will even speak outrageous things against what? The God of gods. Okay, against Yahweh, he'll speak outrageous things against him. Okay, no Jew is going to do except another Jew to do that, to speak outrageous things against Yahweh. No, this will be a Gentile anti-Mashiach. Okay, and he will prosper until the time of wrath is complete. For what has been decided will be done. He will show no regard for the God, Elohim, of his fathers, or the desire of or the one desired by women, nor will he show regard for any God, but will exalt himself above all. So if he is of the, you know, the Muslim faith, the history uh, and heritage behind uh, th that ethnicity, that ethnic line is not necessarily the Muslim faith that goes farther, deeper than that. All right. He could be of, you know, the line of Ishmael. He could be of you know, one of the other Arab lines or whatever, one of the um, sons of Abraham through Couture, uh, because, you know, he married his concubine and had six more sons, all right? And so the, the deities and the pagan gods that they worship, he's not going to show any regard for them, okay? The God of his fathers, okay? He's going to exalt himself above all, right? And what is he going to do instead of these Instead of these way back, even in Yeshua's day, there was no Muslim faith. There was no Allah. They were all worshiping other deities. Okay. It says, instead of these, he will honor a God of fortress. What is Allah? A God of war. So he will honor Allah to bring everyone and unite one together. A God his fathers did not acknowledge. He will honor with gold, silver, and precious stones and costly things. He will attack strong fortresses with the help of a foreign God. All right. In the name of Allah, he's going to be doing this and will greatly honor those who acknowledge him. He will give them authority over many and will parcel out the land for a price. OK, Antiochus IV loved that you worshipped him as a god and he loved that you worshipped uh, Zeus because that was his god. This one is going to also elevate himself above all gods. He's going to use the Muslim faith to get what he wants, but eventually he's only going to want people to worship him. Okay. It says in verse 40, now at that time of the end, the king of the South will attack him and the king of the North will storm out against him with chariots, horsemen, and many ships. See, he doesn't control everything globally. He will invade lands and pass through them like an overflowing river. He will also invade the beautiful land. Many will be overthrown, but these will escape from his hand. Many will be overthrown. He's going to be killing many Jews, many followers of Yeshua as he, as he goes and invades the beautiful land. Okay. But what's going to escape his hand? Edom, Moab, and the chief of the sons of Ammon. See, he doesn't control everything global. The mark is not going to be global. He can't even control the land right next to Jerusalem, right next to Israel. And that is because it's preserved for many people to run to that are believers in Yeshua, that are Jews that don't want to follow the anti-Mashiach, okay? It says he will gain control over the hidden treasures. I'm sorry, it does say he will extend his hand against other countries. The land of Egypt will not escape. He will gain control over the hidden treasures of gold, of silver, as well as all the riches of Egypt. See, he's got to sweep through the beautiful land because he doesn't have control. He wasn't welcomed. OK, as you know, as the long awaited Messiah by the Jewish people, he's got to take it by force. He's got to take it by force. So, no, he's not going to be a Jewish anti-Mashiach. 
All right, so it says he will gain control over the hidden treasures of gold, of silver, as well as over the riches of Egypt. The Libyans and the Cushites will also be under his feet, northern Africa there. But reports from the east and the north will alarm him. This means there are empires and countries that are not under his rule. He does not control the entire globe. All right, they're not accepting the mark of the beast. They're not accepting uh, his rule. They're coming against him. He, he does not have full control of his empire. It's always shaky. Okay. And he will set out in a great rage to destroy and annihilate many. He will pitch his royal tents between the seas and the beautiful holy mountain. Yet he will meet his doom with no one to help. See, Jerusalem is not his headquarters. Okay. He's going to pitch his royal tents where? Between the seas and between the holy mountain. Yet he will meet his doom with no one to help. Okay. And then if we were to go into Daniel chapter 12. We can see that it says, at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people will rise. All right. Michael stands over the nation of Israel. He stands over Jerusalem. He guards over it. Right. There will be a time of distress such as never occurred since the beginning of the nation until then. But at that time, your people, everyone who has found written in the book will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. Some to everlasting life and others to everlasting shame and contempt. Those who will rise will shine like the brightness of the heavenly expanse. And those who turn many to righteousness will be like the stars forever and ever. Amen. So this is the resurrection time. This is Yeshua delivering, saving Jerusalem, saving Israel. Amen. He's restoring Israel. This is not something you're going to see that's going to happen to the great prostitute. Let's go ahead and go back to Revelation 17. Amen. So we're in Revelation 17. All right, starting with verse 7. But the angel said to me, why are you astonished? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and the, of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not and yet is about to rise up from the abyss and head for destruction. Okay, my view on this is this is the fallen angelic being behind the beast system behind driving the empire he's been locked up for a while and now he's going to be released okay and he's going to help drive this system to destruction so he once existed but now doesn't exist and will uh, come up again and then he will head towards destruction okay remember if you've been following my teachings whenever you look at an empire it has several aspects to it so Every kingdom has a king. Every kingdom has a religious system. Every kingdom has a people, has a land mass, has a territory, and every kingdom has a fallen angel behind it. All right. I went into detail on that in my Revelation series, showing you how there, just like you saw with Michael standing up, who watches over the nation of Israel, you'll see also in Daniel how, uh, you know, there was the prince of Persia, there was the prince of Greece that were trying. You know, the prince of Persia was trying to withhold the messenger that was bringing the message to Daniel for 21 days. Okay. And he had to fight him. And then he said, when I leave, Daniel, I've got to fight the prince of Greece. Okay. And so there's that, there's that spiritual warfare going on between kingdoms. It's not just people on the earth fighting one another, but no, there's a spiritual fallen angel behind every system, right? Every kingdom, even America, even England, you know, even, um, you know, China and Russia, uh, you know, countries in Africa, Australia, all these other countries, countries in Europe, they all have fallen angels over them. Okay. Michael stands over Israel. All right. So this beast that comes out of the abyss, I believe is a fallen angel. Okay. I don't believe in the resurrection of the anti-Mashiach that he will die and be resurrected again. Not a view I hold to. All right, so it says, those who dwell on the earth, whose name have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will be astonished when they see the beast because he was and is not and is to come. They're going to be astonished, all right, at what this spiritual entity is going to do with the kingdom. It's going to make it powerful. It's going to, uh, you know, make it turn and attack, okay? And so verse 9, this calls for a mind having wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains. 
on which the woman sits. What are mountains? Kingdoms. What do kingdoms have? Kings. Okay, these are also seven kings. So the mountains, the kingdoms are also represented by kings. Okay, five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must remain a little while. So five kingdoms have fallen. Okay, now this can't be just, you know, the mountains can't be specific kings. Okay, because when you look at the kingdoms of the seven mountains, they had many kings within there. So which king are you going to be talking about? Okay, so it's just reflecting that kingdoms have kings. Okay, and so there were several kings over Egypt. There were several kings over Babylon, several kings over the Medo-Persian Empire and so forth, you know, Roman Empire and everything. So five of these empires have fallen. One is, one kingdom is, okay, and one is yet to come. This is the revived Ottoman Empire, I believe, okay, when it is revived. I'm not talking about the 600 years where it ruled and reigned. It existed, all right, but it's going to come back again. It's the deadly wound that has been healed. The kingdom is going to come back, all right, and it, it'll only remain a little while when it comes back, okay? So it says that the beast that was and is not, he himself is the eighth. So this kingdom that the anti-Mashiach will rule and reign over, okay, it'll have the Muslim faith in it and everything, but it's going to dwarf into the eighth to where you only worship him. He's going to, he's going to create the mark of the beast, right? That mark of the beast is going to not, no longer going to point towards Allah. It's no longer are you going to worship Allah. You're only going to worship him. So you're going to forsake the woman now. You're going to be forsaking the woman that is on the beast, that city that is set up for that religious worship. You're going to begin to forsake her, that woman, okay? Verse 12, the 10 horns that you saw are 10 kings who have not received royal power, but receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour, okay? So when these 10 nations come together, it even says in Daniel that the little horn will come up from amongst them, but they, they're not going to reign for very long. And they're going to follow after the way of the beast. Now, the little horn is going to have to pluck up three of them, it says in Daniel. Okay, It's going to have to pluck up three of them. They're going to give all their power and authority. So it's probably just going to absorb into this eighth manifestation. So all 10 are still there, but they're kind of absorbing it. They gave him trouble, but he plucks them up and absorbs them into his kingdom. Okay. Then 13, verse 13, these kings are of one mind and they give their power and authority to the beast. They will make war against the lamb and the lamb will overcome them because he is the Lord of lords and king of kings. And those with him are called and chosen and faithful. So we're focusing in right now on the beast. Okay, the beast system, the empires here. This final manifestation will have aspects of all these empires. Okay, the the final seventh one will turn into an eighth. So we're focusing in on that seventh head. Okay. We'll, we'll form into an eighth empire where the mark of the beast will be. And that beast will make war against the lamb. He will try and fight Yeshua with the 10 Kings at the end, gathering the Kings up for Har Maghetto. Okay. says they will make war against the lamb. The lamb will overcome them because he is the Lord of lords and king of kings. And those with him are called and chosen and faithful. Okay. Verse 15. Then he tells me the waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. All right. So we get the interpretation of what the waters are. All right. That's no problem. Okay. This religious system will, will reach many nations, the Muslim faith. Uh, I believe it to be, will be, you know, reaching this entire empire here. It'll affect the entire of the seven heads, which it's, you know, it's rising right now. It has much control over the Middle East of Northern Africa towards China, all right, we, over there in India. And then it's affecting Europe right now at a great rate, okay? So this prostitute is a woman, a religious system, okay? This city re represents the religious system. All right. And it represents the headquarters of the anti-Mashiach, which is not Yerushalayim. They will make her desolate and naked. Whoa, wait a minute. The 10 horns that you saw and the beast, 
These will hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. Okay, does this happen to Yerushalayim? Will she, uh, you know, the 10 horns are going to turn and make her desolate? Is that what's going to happen and burn her flesh up with fire? Let's go to Zechariah 14. Let's go to Zechariah 14. Amen. In Zechariah 14, what does it say? Behold, a day of Yahweh is coming when your plunder will be divided in your midst. I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to wage war. Okay. The city shall be captured. The houses ransacked and the women ravished. Half of the city will be exiled, but the remainder of the people will not be cut off from the city. Where does it say that it's going to get burned down, totally destroyed? as the prostitute will, as the great harlot will. It doesn't say that here. Then Yahweh will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in a day of battle. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which lies to the east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a huge valley. Half of the mountain will move toward the north and half of it toward the south. Then you will flee through my mountain valley, because the mountain valley will reach to Azel. So there's still going to be mountains there. All right. This is not when you go and you study the seventh bowl judgment. All right. This is that that earthquake there is going to flatten out the mountains. There's not going to be mountains around. All right. But here on the Mount of Olives, it's going to make the valleys deeper. Then you will flee from my mountain valley. Uh, because the mountain valley will reach to Azel. Yes, you will flee like you fled from the earthquake in the days of King Uzziah of Yehuda. Then Yahweh, my Elohim, Yahweh, my Elohim will come and all the Kedoshim, all the holy ones with him. All right. It's going to be Noah and Enoch and Elijah and Moshe and, uh, you know, Yosef. All the righteous prophets are going to come with him. Those who are in Yeshua are going to come with him. Okay. The holy ones. In that day, there will be no light, cold, or frost. It will be a day known only to Yahweh, neither day nor night. Even in the evening time, there will be light. Moreover, in that day, living waters will flow from Jerusalem, half toward the east sea and half toward the west sea, both in the summer and in the winter. All right. Yahweh then will be king over all the earth. In that day, Yahweh will be Achad and his name Achad. Okay. This is not the great prostitute. Look at the restoration to Jerusalem. Look at the water flowing. Okay, this is not Jerusalem burning and being utterly destroyed. No, it's being saved. Only half the city gets ransacked. The other gets cut off. Okay, then Yeshua comes. And he, what does he do? He fights the nations. Okay, he saves Jerusalem. He delivers it. This is not speaking of Revelation 17. Let's go ahead and go back. Amen. So as we can see here in verse 16, the 10 horns that you saw and the beast, they will hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. All right. So they're going to begin to turn on this headquarters and begin to destroy it. Why? Because it represents not the worship of the anti mashiach it represents that religious system, that false religious system, amen? And so for God has put it in their hearts to do his will and to be of one mind and to give their royal power to the beast until the words of Elohim are fulfilled. And the woman that you saw is the great city exercising kingship over the kings of the earth. This is the headquarters, amen? This is the headquarters, but it is not Jerusalem. Jerusalem is not the headquarters. Okay. Hey Amen. So what I want to do right now is take you to Revelation 12. So you have the woman, okay, which is a city. Amen. It is the great prostitute here. But look at, we have another woman in the book of Revelation. And the woman is Israel. Okay. So I don't believe they're talking about the same woman. 
the same thing here. Let's go ahead and uh, look at Revelation 12, starting verse one. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head, a crown of 12 stars. She is pregnant, crying out in birth pains and agony to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, a great fiery dragon that had seven heads and 10 horns and seven royal crowns on his head. His tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven. It hurled them to the earth. Now the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth. And so when, so that whenever she gave birth, he might devour her child. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all nations with an iron rod. And her child was snatched away to God, to uh, Elohim and to his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by Elohim so that might take care of her for where? 1260 days. All right. So this woman obviously is Israel fleeing. Okay. This is not going to be a Jew anti-Mashiach that's doing this. This is going to be a pagan Gentile. Okay. Probably of the Muslim faith, following the ways of the dragon, persecuting the woman, persecuting Israel, driving her out. Okay. A war broke out in heaven, Michael and his angel making war against the dragon, the dragon and his angels fought. See the spiritual warfare going on over kingdoms, over nations, okay? But they were not strong enough, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the ancient serpent called the devil, and uh, Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Then I heard lost my place here. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now have come the salvation and power and kingdom of our God and the authority of his anointed one for the accuser of our brothers and sisters. The one who accuses them before our God day and night has been thrown down. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimonies, and they did not love their lives unto death. Amen. And so it says, therefore, rejoice, O heaven, and you who dwell on in them, woe to the earth and to the sea, for the devil has come down to you with great rage, knowing that his time is short. Now, when the dragon had saw that he had been thrown to the earth, he stalked the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of great, of the great eagle, so that she might fly away from the presence of the serpent into the wilderness to a place that is uh, to care for her for what? Times, times, and half a times, three and a half years. Amen. For out from, um, I'm sorry, and from out of the, his mouth, the serpent spew water like a river after the woman in order to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to the aid of the woman. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had spewed from his mouth. So the dragon became enraged at the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her offspring, those who keep the commandments of uh, Elohim and hold to the testimony of Yeshua. And he stood on the shore of the sea, amen? So again, you've got this woman, it's not connected to Yerushalayim, it's connected to Israel. And anytime you talk about Yerushalayim, you're talking about Israel. There's a direct connection to the people of Israel this way. And so, uh, no, the great city is not Yerushalayim, that great city, the great harlot. Amen. The next place I want to take you is Isaiah chapter four. This is a place that the, um, the, those that hold that the great harlot is Yerushalayim will try and take you to. But as we can see, it is restoration of Yerushalayim. It's not the total destruction of Yerushalayim. So it says here, and in that day, seven women shall take hold of one man saying, we will eat our food, our own food and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by your name to take away our reproach. In that day, the branch of the Lord, the branch of Yahweh, okay, which will be Yeshua, shall be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and appealing for those of Israel who have escaped. And it shall come to pass that he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy, everyone who is recorded among the living in Jerusalem. Then the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and purged the blood of Yerushalayim from her midst by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. Then Yahweh will create above 
every dwelling place of Mount Zion and above her assemblies, a cloud and a smoke by day and the shining of a flaming fire by night for all over, I'm sorry, for over all the glory, there will be a covering and there will be a tabernacle for shade in the daytime for the heat, for a place of refuge and for a shelter from storm and rain. You see, Jerusalem is a place of being purged, right? It's not the great harlot, okay? Zion is being washed and, and being purged and made new, all right? It is through the trying and testing of the anti-Mashiach trying to kill them is the burning away, okay, uh, is the judgment that is coming so that they stand strong. Israel is being delivered. It is being delivered by Yeshua. So no, even though Yerushalayim may have fallen under the spell of the anti-Mashiach and under the spell of that great city uh, and was in, uh, you know, control, uh, authority under uh, the anti-Mashiach. It was not the headquarters, okay, but it's being purged. It's being um, uh, washed, okay? That's not what you're going to see that's going to happen to the great harlot, okay? As we see here in Jeremiah 22, starting with verse one, thus says the Lord, go down to the house of the king of Yehuda and speak, the, speak these words and say, hear the word of the Lord, uh, O king of Yehuda, you who sit on the throne of David, you and your servants and your people who enter these gates, thus says the Lord, execute judgment and righteousness and deliver the plundered out of the hand of the oppressor. Do no wrong and do no violence to the stranger, the fatherless, or the widow, nor shed innocent blood in this place. For if you, if you indeed do this thing, then shall enter the gates of this house, riding on a horse in chariots, accompanied by servants and people and kings who sit on the throne of David. But if you will not hear the words, I will swear by myself, says the Lord, that this house shall become desolate. All right, this already happened, okay? For thus says the Lord to the house of the king of Yehuda, you are Gilead, uh, Gilead to me, the head of Lebanon. Yet I surely will make you a wilderness, cities which are not inhabited. I will prepare destroyers against you. Every one will, uh, with his weapons, they will cut down your choice cedars and cast them into fire. And many nations will pass by the city and everyone will say to his neighbor, why has the Lord done this to this great city? Is this what they're going to say? to Jerusalem after Yeshua returns. That's not what they're going to say to Jerusalem after he returns. Yeshua is restoring Jerusalem. He's saving it from the Antichrist. Okay? So this scripture right here helps prove that the great harlot that is being spoken of in Revelation is not is not Jerusalem. Okay? Cuz this already happened. All right, it was made desolate for a what a season and a time, and then it was restored. That's where we get Nehemiah and we get Ezra rebuilding the second temple. Okay. That's not what you're going to see. Yeshua is going to save and deliver Jerusalem. It's not going to be utterly destroyed. Okay. It doesn't have to be utterly destroyed to go through a purging or refining. Okay. The refining doesn't utterly destroy the thing that's being purified. This is one I like to go to right here. So it's in Isaiah chapter one, verses 21 through 27. Okay. How the faithful city has become a harlot. It was full of justice, righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross, your wine mixed with water. Your princes are rebellious and your companies of thieves. Everyone loves bribes and follows after rewards. They do not defend the fatherless nor does the cause of the widow come before them. Therefore, the Lord says, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, ah, I will rid myself of my adversaries and take vengeance on my enemies. I will turn my hand against you and thoroughly purge away your dross and take away all your alloy. I will restore your judges at, as at first and your counselors as at the beginning. Afterward, you will be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city, Zion will be redeemed 
with justice and her penitence, penitence with righteousness. She will repent. So Zion is going to be redeemed with justice and she is going to repent and be righteous. That did not happen to the great harlot. Okay, see how easy this is to destroy the argument, even though there's similarities that you might think that it is Yerushalayim being spoken of in Revelation 17. It is easily refuted, okay, because Zion will repent. It'll be redeemed, okay? That's what Yeshua is going to do, all right? As we bring this uh, teaching to a close, again, I know it's long, but we're going to do chapter 18 next time together. Let us now go to Ezekiel 16. Amen. So in Ezekiel 16, of course, this is one that oftentimes those who believe that the great harlot, the great prostitute is Jerusalem, they want to bring you here to Ezekiel 16. But of course, they don't read the entire chapter, the restoration part. Okay, which clearly shows you that Revelation 17 and 18 is not Jerusalem. So let's begin here. All right. Again, this is a long chapter, but it's very necessary to read the whole thing. So in verse one, the word of Yahweh came to me saying, son of man, confront Jerusalem and her abominations and say, thus says Yahweh to Jerusalem, your origin and your birth are from the land of the Canaanite. Your father was an Amorite. Your mother was a Hittite. As for your birth on the day you were born, your umbilical cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water for cleansing. You were never rubbed with salt, nor were you swaddled at all. No, I pitied you enough to do any of these things to you out of compassion. Instead, you were cast out into the open field, for, uh, for you were detested on the day you were born. When I passed by you and saw you kicking in your blood, I said to you, in your blood, live. Yes, I said to you, in your blood, live. I made you grow as myriads, uh, like a branch of the field. You grew up, got tall, and came to full adoration or adornment. Your breasts were formed. Your hair sprouted, yet you were naked and bare. Again, I passed by and saw you, and behold, you were truly at the time of love. I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. I swore to you and enter into a covenant with you. This is the marriage covenant with Yerushalayim, says Yahweh. You became mine. So he's never going to forsake her. He's never going to leave her. Okay, She's never going to be utterly destroyed. Then I washed you with water, rinsed off your blood from on you and anointed you with oil. I clothed you with embroidery and put sandals of fine leather on you. I wrapped you in fine linen and covered you with silk. I adored you with jewelry, put bracelets on your hands and a necklace on your neck. I put a ring in your nose, earrings on your ears, and a crown of glory on your head. So you were adorned with gold and silver, and your raiment was of fine linen, silk, and embroidery. You ate fine uh, flour, honey, and oil. You became exceedingly beautiful and advanced to the kingdom. Your fame spread among the nations because of your beauty, for it was perfect through my splendor, which I bestowed on you. It is a declaration of Yahweh. But you trusted in your beauty and used your fame to become a harlot. Okay. So this is Jerusalem being, you know, given all this luscious things. What? By who? By Yahweh. Okay. Now she's going to use it for her harlotry. Okay. But that's not what you're going to see in Revelation 18 when we get there. All right. Let's see. But you trusted in your beauty and used your fame to become a harlot. You poured out your enticement on everyone who passed by. They were his, all right? You took your garments, made high places, decked out in various colors and fornication, fornicated on them. This should not happen. It should not be. You also took your jewelry, my gold and my silver, which I gave you and made images, male images of yourself and committed harlotry with them. You took your embroidered garments, covered them and placed my oil and my incense uh, before them. My bread that I gave you, fine flour, oil, and honey that I fed you with you, yet you set them as a sweet aroma. That is what happened. It is a declaration of Yahweh. You took your sons and your daughters whom you bore for me and sacrificed them to be eaten by them. Where your obscene practices not enough, you slaughtered my children, making them pass through fire for them. In all your abominations and harlotry, you have not remembered the days of your youth 
when you were naked and bare, kicking about in your blood. So it was after all your wickedness. Oi, oi to you. It is a declaration of Yahweh. Then you built a mount for yourself. You made a high place for yourself in every square. You built your lofty place at the head of every street. You made your beautiful, your beauty an abomination. You spread your legs for every passing by and multiplied your harlotry. You committed immoral, uh, immorality with the Egyptians, your lustful neighbors. You multiplied your prostitution to provoke me. So behold, I stretch out my hand over you. I diminished your ration. I gave you over to those who hate you, the daughters of the Philistines who were shamed of your innocent, uh, indecent conduct. I'm sorry. Then you also played the harlot with the Assyrians, never being satisfied. You played the harlot with them and still you were not satisfied. So you multiplied your harlotry toward the land of the merchants of the Chaldea. Yet even this, with this, you did not satisfy. You were not satisfied. How weak is your heart? It is a declaration of Yahweh Elohim. While you are doing all these things, the work of a shameless harlot, when you built your mount at the head of every road and make your high places in every street, yet you were not like a harlot since you scoffed at receiving payment, okay? You didn't allow payment to be brought to you, okay? You were brought to ruin. They, they played the harlotry, but you, you, you lost your beauty, okay? You lost everything because you didn't take payment for what they were doing with you. Okay, that's not what you see in chapter 18 of Revelation. Please keep this key. Okay, she's giving everything away. She's not magnified in beauty. She was. Okay, that's when Yahweh first blew her up in that manner. All right, with, you know, King David and everything. Uh, um, but she's been giving it away ever since. Okay. You adulterous wife who receives strangers instead of her husband. To all prostitutes, gifts are given, but you gave your gifts all to your lovers. Okay? That's not being spoken of in Revelation 18. You, uh, you bribe them to come to you from every side in your harlotry. Okay? So you are the opposite of the other woman. You are the opposite. Okay? No one runs after you for favors. You give payment and none is given to you. So you are opposite. Therefore, harlot, hear the word of Yahweh. Thus says Yahweh Elohim, because of your filth was poured out and your nakedness exposed through your harlotry with your lovers, because of all the idols of your abominations and because of the blood of your children that you gave to them. Therefore, behold, I will gather all your lovers, those who have pleased, those you have pleased, and all those you have loved, with all of them that you have hated. I will gather them against you from every side. I will expose your nakedness to them so that they may see all your nakedness. So I will judge you as a woman who committed adultery and shed blood are judged. Then I will bring on you the blood of fury and jealousy. I will give you into their hand. They will tear down your mount and break down your high places. They will strip you of your clothes and take your jewelry. Look at this is not describing the great harlot. Okay. She is being stripped, okay? Her enemies are stripping her bare. They will leave you naked and bare. They will also incite an assembly against you, stone you with stones and thrust you through your swords. They will set your house on fire and execute judgment on you in the sight of many women. So I will cause you to stop your harlotry. You will never again pay for a lover. So I will calm my fury against you and my jealousy will turn away from you. Is that being shown in 17 and 18? Absolutely not. In 17 and 18, the harlot is getting utterly destroyed, never to rise again. Then I will be quiet and anger and angry no longer. Is that what it says in chapter 17 and 18 of Revelation? No. Because you did not remember the days of your youth, but enraged me in all these things, behold, I will also bring your way on your head. It is a declaration of Yahweh. You have not committed this wickedness on top of all your abomin abom abominations. Behold, everyone who uses Proverbs will say this proverb against you, saying, as the mother, so her daughter. Okay, as the mother, who is the mother? The Hittite and the Amorite, right? So is the daughter. Okay, so Yerushalayim here is not being spoken of as a mother, spoken of as a daughter. You are your mother's daughter who despises her husband and her children. You are your sister uh, 
you are the sister of your sisters who despise their husband and their children. Your mother was a Hittite. Your father was an Amorite. Okay. Jerusalem is being thought of as a daughter here. She's not the mother of prostitutes. Okay. Your elder sister who lives to your left is Samaria. She and her daughters. Your younger sister who lives to your, your right is Sodom with her daughters. You have not only walked in their ways and gone after their abominations, but in a very short time, you have acted more corruptly than them in all their ways. Why? They received payment. They became beautified by their harlotry. But Yerushalayim gave it all away, gave the beauty away. They allowed the other nations to strip them bare. That's what Antiochus IV did, right? He stripped her. Okay. All the other nations demanded payment. Okay that the kings of Israel had to pay. They were stripped of their wealth, stripped of their, of their uh, beauty. That's not what Revelation um, 17 and 18 says about that great city. All right, let's go on. Verse 48, as I live, it is a declaration of Yahweh. Your sister Sodom with her daughters have not done as you have done, you and your daughters. Behold, this was the iniquity of your daughter Sodom pride, gluttony, and careless ease. So had she and her daughters. And she did not strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. So they were haughty and committed abominations before me. Therefore, I removed them when I saw it. Moreover, Samaria did not commit even half of your sins. You multiplied your abominations beyond theirs. So you made your sister seem righteous by all your disgusting things that you have done. You also bear your own shame since you have interceded for your sisters because of your sins that you committed more treacherous than theirs. They appeared more righteous than you. So you also be ashamed, bear your disgrace since you have justified your sisters. Let's go on. I will return their captivity, the captivity of Sodom and her daughters, the captivity of Samaria and her daughters, and along with them, your own captivity. So you will bear your own disgrace and be ashamed of all that you have done in becoming a consolation to them. Your sisters, Sodom, and, your and her daughters, Samaria, and her daughters will return to their former state. You and your daughters will return to your former state. Was not your sister, Sodom, an object of scorn to you in the day of your pride before your own wickedness was exposed? Now you have become an object of scorn for the daughters of Aram and all that surround her, for the daughters of the Philistines from all around you who despise you. You will bear your wickedness and your abominations. It is a declaration of Yahweh. For thus says Yahweh Elohim, I will do to you just as you have done since you despised the oath by breaking the covenant. Nevertheless, I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth. Moreover, I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. Then you will remember your ways and be ashamed when you receive your older and younger sister. I will give them to you for daughters, yet not because of your covenant. So notice there's a restoration of Jerusalem happening here, a restoring of the covenant. That's not what you see in Revelation 17 and 18. It says, so I will establish my covenant with you and I will know and you will know that I am Yahweh. So you will remember, be ashamed, and never open your mouth again because of your disgrace. When I have forgiven you of all that you have done, it is a declaration of Yahweh. So this declaration, there is a forgiveness that is happening. That is not what you see in Revelation 17 and 18. So is the great prostitute the city of Jerusalem, a future city of Jerusalem, an eschatological city of Jerusalem, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Because that city will never be forgiven. There is no repentance of that city. There is no restoring of that city that you see and read about in Revelation 17 and 18. Amen. So next time together, we will be walking through chapter 18, continually, continuing to establish the point that I am making. And that is the great harlot of Revelation 17 and 18 is not Yerushalayim, a future Yerushalayim, nor is the anti-Mashiach going to be a Jew. Amen. He will be a Gentile. 
its headquarters will not be in Yerushalayim. It'll be in another area in the future. Amen. So I hope this was helpful to you and we will continue to establish this next time together in part two. So until we meet again, everyone, shalom.